Hello everybody and welcome to part three of the Dovetail Box project. In today's video, we're gonna get the tails cut. Okay, so if you want to get this part of the project done right, then definitely have a look at my video on how to saw correctly. Ton of tips in that to help you with this process because it's not just a case of angling the saw and hoping for the best. There's a ton of techniques that you can apply to this. Have a look at that and then come back here. There is a link to it in the description below. Now in this series, I will primarily be showing you how to cut these dovetail joints freehand by using a Western style push saw and a crosscut saw if you have one. However, I'm becoming increasingly aware that beginners are really favoring Japanese saws because they're incredibly lightweight, easy to use, they cut on the pull stroke and like they're just perfect for beginners. Now, if you download the tool list for this project, there is a link to that below as well. I've put a recommendation for one of my favorite Japanese saws on there, which I think you'll really like. And to satisfy those of you who don't have the time or patience or whatever it happens to be to learn how to do dovetails freehand, I will be demonstrating the use of a Katz Moses dovetail guide, which has magnetic sides and allows you to cut the dovetails with square end grain to the perfect ratio. And it's just great for people who are struggling with cutting these joints. So when it comes to dovetailing, people often get confused about the most important part to get right. A lot of people assume that they need to get the angles of the dovetail spot on. But as we said in the previous video, you don't like, if one of them ends up at one in six and one of them ends up at one in eight, it's not a huge issue. It does affect the aesthetics obviously, but in terms of functionality, it doesn't matter. And also if we were to get them slightly off or slightly askew, we're gonna be tracing around them to match onto the pins later on anyway. So because people focus so much on getting those angles accurate, what they forget to do is focus on the most important part, which is getting the end grain square of the dovetail. So in this example, you can see I had good intentions of squaring that line across as we did in the previous episode with a pencil. That's nice and fine and accurate and everything like that. But the saw cut next to it it's not square, it's not going along that line, it's going off at an angle. And in fact, what we've done here is actually create a wedge shape. And that wedge shape, even though we've traced around the bottom of it perfectly with a knife and we've got a really nice fit going on at the start of this, you see that's a perfect fit at the bottom. If I was to assemble this, ah, I've broken the component. Now in this example, the fact that this was out of square is very obvious. You can quite clearly see that, but this effect can still happen even if that is just ever so slightly off. This is particularly the case when you're working with wood such as oak, for example. Oak splits incredibly easily and it only takes a little bit of a wedging action to split it in half. Don't ask me how I know, it has happened so many times to me. But this is a prime example as to why you need to cut perfectly square across the end grain. The angle of the dovetail doesn't matter. So when it comes to cutting out these tails, I like to break it down into two stages. The first time we will establish the cut along the end grain and make sure that is perfectly square. And then after that, we will get the angle of the tail correct afterwards. Now, what I've done on here is I've drawn the tails on the back of the component, which as I said in the previous video, I wouldn't normally do because I can't see what's happening from here, but it's just so you guys can see what's going on. So I'm gonna put the saw right up against my thumb and I'm just angling it up so that I take out the back corner of that line. And I'm cutting on the waist side here and just a little cut like that allows me to see where I'm cutting in relation to the line. So then when I can see how close I am, I can start sawing and as I'm doing so, I'm lowering the saw working that line from back to front. And there you go, so the saw is now leveled out and I've established that line across the end grain and because it's so shallow, I can now focus on getting the tilt of the saw correct to do the rest of the dovetail. So when I do this, I'm using long strokes. After all, I did purchase every single one of these teeth on this saw, so I might as well use them all. Now I'll go on to the next one, take out the back corner, see where I'm cutting in relation to the line. Okay, and then as I'm cutting, start leveling out the saw. End grain is now established and I can focus on cutting the ratio now. 
The other thing you can do if you're struggling with this is actually angle the workpiece to the ratio of the dovetails so that then these lines that you want to cut are going straight down. So again, starting on the back corner. Check where I am in relation, okay. So I'll carry on with that. End grain's now established and I've just got to focus now on cutting perfectly straight. And this is where the use of a dovetail guide is so useful with regards to getting end grain square because a lot of people look at these and they just think it's a way in order to get that perfect dovetail ratio, which it is. But the main benefit I see in these is that it's great for getting that end grain cut perfectly square. The fact on this Cat's Moses one, you've got two magnets there to guide you, means you've got a lot of surface area across the length of this dovetail guide in order to hold that saw perfectly square. So I'll demonstrate that now. All you have to do with this is find the angled face, pop that on the line so it's just in the waist side, and it works best with a Japanese saw, but all you've got to do is just light strokes, let the magnets guide it. So just cut down to that marking gauge baseline that we scratched on previously. And there we go. We are left with an extremely clean cut and it's perfectly square and the ratio is spot on as well. And just by these results, you can see why more and more people are opting for Japanese saws. This was the cut that we did with the Japanese saw in the Cat's Moses Guide just now. And these were the three that I did with my Western push saw. The Japanese saw cut is so much finer, so much cleaner, which doesn't detract from the quality of these at all because it's all on the waist side of the line. It's all gonna be removed later on anyway. But you can see how clean and fine that finished result is. And as I said, there's a link to a recommended Japanese saw in the tool list for this project. So what I'm gonna do now is cut this middle bit out of the tails and I'm using a fret saw to do this. This has an incredibly fine blade, which makes it easy to go down into the cuts and steer whatever direction you want. Whereas if you're using something like a coping saw to cut out that middle area, it's gonna be a bit more difficult to get that turn complete. What you might have to do is kind of a wider turn with the saw, but don't force it too much or else you might bruise the tails or you might even snap the blade, neither of which is ideal. And when cutting this middle section out, what I've ensured is that I've left a little bit of material at the bottom in order to chisel back to later. Now, this amount of material depends largely on how confident you're feeling with your coping saw slash fret saw. I've left it about a millimeter, millimeter and a half shy of the baseline, so then I can chisel that out later. For now, we need to cut these edges off. So just to make it clearer, this is the area we're removing. And what I'm gonna do is cut this off with a crosscut saw. Once again, starting on that back corner, establish that top line, and then I can just focus on cutting plum there. Now I've left, once again, about a millimeter or so to chisel back to later on. We're going to cut down to that tail, making sure not to actually cut into it. There you go. Remove those little bits there. And we've left about half a millimeter, millimeter of material to chisel back to afterwards. And then what I like to do here is get a chisel that is wider than the component I'm working on. The chisel will go into the line that we scratched around the side of the component. And then I'll just tap it down vertical following the line that I can see on the front you guys can see it on the back there just very carefully track it and if you want to make this easier you can put a square in here as well just to check your progress but I find that tracking the line is usually okay now for the other side as I said at the start of the video a Japanese saw even with a rip cut pattern is still usually fine enough to cross cut the material. Now in this case, I'm gonna cut about two millimeters away from the line, just to replicate what some of you may do if you're not feeling confident enough to cut to the line. And I will show you how to remedy that. So firstly, have a look at the quality of finish. 
even from a rip tooth pattern that's very good for cross cutting thanks to the fine teeth on a japanese saw secondly have a look at how much material we've got removed that's about two millimeters maybe even a tad more which is a very common thing to happen for people who aren't feeling confident with the saw at this stage so to remove this much material the last thing you want to do is put your chisel directly into that line and hit it with a mallet the reason for this is because the angle on the chisel is going to create a wedge and if you've got that much material on the wedge side what's going to happen is it's going to push the chisel back below the gauge line therefore you'll get a gap on this shoulder so what you want to do is remove as much of that pressure as possible and then commit to doing the final chop so in this case all i'm going to do is just half the material with the chisel and you can see i'm holding the chisel nice and low down when i do this if you're holding it up by the handle becomes very difficult to get that in the right place. Just hold it down the bottom like a pencil. It's far easier that way. Half the material, I'll just move my hand up so you guys can see now. And then just tap that down vertical. And your chisel needs to be sharp for this, by the way. So once again, we will find the halfway point and halve that. Okay, and now I reckon that is close enough to put straight into the line and then tap that vertical. So once again, I'm just tracking the lines down the front of these tails. And there you go, remove that, get rid of that little bit in the corner and then come down from above again. There we go, sorted. And then once you're done with this stage, what you should be able to see is a very faint white line around the outside corners of this shoulder, which is the original marking gauge line that you've bisected with the chisel. It kind of shows like this little polished burnished area around there. So now we've done that, we can focus on removing the last of that material in between the two dovetails and you follow much the same principles here. It's about removing as much material as possible before taking that final chop in order to reduce the possibility of the chisel being pushed back below the baseline. And I would just like to talk a little bit about the positioning of your body when taking this final chop. Because what I've often seen is people clamp this up in a vise and then chisel into it this way by like whacking that with a mallet and stuff like that. But by doing that, you lose a lot of power in the malleting process or the chiseling process because this is kind of like deflecting a little bit and you're losing so much of that power. So I always think it's much better to have this flat on the workbench get it clamped down with something so it's not scooting around all over the place. And then what I've done is I've oriented this timber in a way that I can look along the baseline. So that way, when I put my chisel into said baseline, I can see if it's cutting square. Whereas if this component was sort of facing towards me like this, I can put the chisel into that baseline, but I can't actually see if it's cutting square or not. I can see if it's like tilting side to side, but that doesn't really matter at this point. I want to make sure that I'm cutting square here. So by having the component go sideways and me look along the baseline, I can easily see if I'm cutting square or not. And your eye is very good at seeing this angle, but once again, if you're not feeling too confident, just get an engineer's square in there and check it. And after doing this so many times, I've worked out that I need the component to my right because I'm a left-handed. So my chisel will go here and my hand just rests on the bench as opposed to people doing it like this, right-handed, and then your hand's kind of covering it. I don't know, that just feels a little bit unnatural to me. Not only because it's right-handed, but because my hand is kind of like covering the material. I think it's much better to have your hand clear of the material so then you can easily see what's going on while you're eating it with a mallet. So we'll get that now. So firstly, what I'm noticing here is that one of my saw cuts hasn't quite reached the baseline. So what I'll do is just rest the chisel against the side of the tail. This hand's completely clear. Make sure to clamp this down when you're doing it. Don't like hold it like this while doing it because that's obviously a recipe for disaster. Hand is clear, rest it against the tail and just sort of rock it up and finish that cut. In fact, I'll do it on both. And doing this gives you a lovely clean corner at the bottom of the dovetail. And then I've picked a chisel here that is as wide as possible and will fit within that gap with just a little bit to spare either side for me to clean up later. And once again, you should probably hold the chisel down the bottom when you're doing this as it makes things far easier, but I'm gonna hold it slightly higher up so you guys can actually see what's going on. So pardon my wobbly hands. There you go. 
So we'll halve the material and just tap that down at 90 degrees. And I'm only gonna to go to halfway from here. You don't wanna go all the way through because what that's gonna do is break out on the opposite side. And also I can't see if I'm chopping below the baseline on the opposite side or not. We're just gonna focus on what we can see at this point. So now I think that's enough pressure relieved. Chisel will then go into the line. Make sure that's firmly locked in there and tap at 90 degrees. You can hear the tone change there. That's where it hit the previous part that I chopped out and I know that it's at halfway. And I can just sort of finish off these corners now just by carefully paring those down by hand. There you go, very little pressure needed here because this is a soft wood and I'm working with sharp chisels as well, of course. So we'll go to the opposite side now. Once again, I'll just finish off that saw cut. And then we will remove half the material, light taps at this point so that it meets the other cut that we just did without too much damage. And there we go. Remove half the material again. And now chisel into the baseline. Voila. Clean out those corners. Now I'll just get a small chisel to kind of get all that rubbish out of there. And now I'll just get the piece up in a vise and you can see I've got the white line there and the white line at the front, which shows that I've bisected that marking gauge line. I'm gonna rest my chisel on top of that material and just carefully wiggle it through to halfway and make sure there's no little bits in there that are gonna prevent this joint from sitting together. Now this chisel needs to be sharp because you don't wanna be putting too much pressure on this because if you slip and you hit that back corner, that entire face is gonna break out and you cause a lot of damage by doing so. Right, and there you go. That is how you cut the tails of a dovetail joint. So just to reiterate the things that you learned in this lesson, make sure to cut that end grain square. If not, you're gonna end up like this sorry component where the wedging action of that out of square dovetail has just completely split it in half. So focus on that end grain. If you don't get the angle right for the time being, then don't worry about it. We're gonna trace around it later on in the next video anyway. So make sure to put those sawing techniques into practice. If you want a refresher on those, have a look below. There's a link to my video on how to saw correctly. But if you can't be asked to do that, then just grab yourself a dovetail guide and a Japanese saw. Again, there's a link to both of these in the description if it's something you're interested in. You're now ready to move on to the next lesson. So you can do so by clicking the link below, which will take you to my website, where you'll get full access to all the resources available. Press the big round subscribe button to the left-hand side if you haven't already, and follow me on social media if you haven't already. See you in the next video.